الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد نصركم الله ببدر وأنتم أذلة فاتقوا الله لعلكم تشكرون The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم صل على The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa'l-Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Respected Shuhada Muhammad. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's performance on the Battle of Badr is without a doubt one of the greatest performances in the history of the religion of Islam. The Battle of Badr occupies a prominent position in the history of the religion. On the first level, the Battle of Badr was the first ever battle to be fought in Islamic history. Indeed, the battle on the second level was fought in the holy month of Ramadan. In the second year after the Hijrah of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salam Muhammad wa Muhammad. Indeed, the Imam's performance on that day remained one of the greatest attributes that he would claim from that day onwards as being one of the greatest performances of any warrior in Islamic history. Without a doubt, there was no warrior who could rival the displays of Ali ibn Abi Talib on the battlefield. On the day of the Battle of Badr, Ali ibn Abi Talib was only in his early 20s, not older than the age of 24. Yet his performance on that day was a performance full of bravery, full of valor, and indeed at a time when the Muslim community was at a transition phase. For as we know, the Muslim community had just moved from the land of Mecca to the land of Medina. The nascent Muslim community was constantly on the receiving end of pressure from the aristocrats of Mecca who could not believe how they had lost them. You find therefore that the Ansar of Medina and the Muhajirun of Mecca were trying to their hardest to amalgamize alongside one another, were trying their hardest to make a force that was strong enough to defend the land of Medina. And indeed the Battle of Badr was the first battle in the religion of Islam which not only sought to protect the Muslims, but sought to protect all the monotheist faiths in Medina. Because in Medina at the time, the Christians were worshipping in their churches, and the Jews were worshipping in their synagogues. Therefore, when the attack was made onto Medina, the Holy Prophet has mentioned it as a clear fact, that as the statesman and the leader of the society in Medina, he would ensure that he protects all the Christians, all the Jews, and all the Muslims. Many times you hear the accusation that the Prophet Muhammad was a man of the sword, that he wanted to spread the religion of Islam by the sword. We had seen in the previous nights that for the first 13 years of his life in Mecca, there was no sword at all. And now in the second year in Medina, in the 15th year of his prophethood at the age of 55, you had seen that the use of the sword was to defend the religion, not on the offensive. Because there was an attack from outside of Medina by the Meccans, the Quran ordered the Prophet not to defend simply the Muslims. 
The Quran ordered the Prophet to defend all people who believed in one God. While in the new Medina community there was Jews, there were Christians, and there were Muslims, the religion of Islam wanted jihad to be a protection for all the monotheists in that state. Therefore you find that the battle of Badr is of the utmost importance. Not only because it allowed us to understand the political circumstances of the time, but it also showed us that you may be small in number, but you may be great in faith. In which way, those people who attended the Battle of Badr were not great in their numbers, but their faith in God allowed them to achieve an unprecedented victory. They weren't more than 313, but when you look at that number, you realize that when you have the faith in God, God brings you victories even against enemies who are three times your size. And that's why later on in Islamic history, many of the companions who participated at the Battle of Badr would be proud to call themselves Badris. Many companions in the caliphates after the Prophet had died would be very proud to say, I was present on the day of Badr. I fought on the day of Badr. Why? Because it was one of the greatest accolades to ever have that you fought in the first battle in the religion of Islam. It's one thing migrating with the Prophet Muhammad to Medina. It's another thing being willing to lay down your life for him in a battle. There are many who migrated with him to Medina, but not all of them were willing to necessarily lay down their life on the battlefield. Therefore, later on, you'd find the companions themselves would be proud to say that they were Bedris. Even Umar ibn al-Khattab would, in his economic policy, divide funds given to the companions in terms of whether they were at Badr or not. If a companion was at Badr, he'd receive more funds from the treasury than those who weren't. Because there was that reverence that was given to anyone who attended on the day of Badr. If that was the amount of reverence to those who were at the battle of Badr, then how about for the man who gave the most sterling performance on that day? When you look at Ali ibn Abi Talib's performance on the day of Badr, it was a performance that no warrior could ever come near. And indeed, when you look at the words of those around him on that day, they highlighted to you that the day of Badr purely belonged to the son of Abu Talib. Therefore, let's examine the context of the battle of Badr and indeed what happened that led to the battle in the following stages. Number one, why were the Meccans so adamant to attack Medina? What was the three main reasons that they would always bring up? Number two, how did the Holy Prophet find out that Abu Sufyan had a caravan of weapons which he had brought with him from Syria? Number three, when the Meccans came towards Medina, how many horses and camels did they bring with them? And just how powerful was their army? Number four, when the Prophet asked his companions, are you ready for better? How many of his companions said to him, are you sure you want to fight such a strong opposition? And which companion on that day turned around and said, Ya Rasulallah, if you want us to dig ourselves in the ocean, we'll even do that for you. Number five, on the day of Badr, how did Hamza introduce the soldiers on the army of the Prophet? And which famous mother was her brothers and her father on the opposition side? Number six, what was the aftermath of the Battle of Badr? And how did the Holy Prophet treat the prisoners from that battle? Did he kill them? Did he imprison them? Or did he have another solution for them? Number seven, how did the Battle of Badr result in Ali ibn Abi Talib's abuse on the mimbar being stopped by an Umayyad Khalifa? And number eight, and of the utmost importance, how did Yazid in his poetry in Sham use the battle of Badr to insult Sayyidah Zainab. Let's examine this in order that we understand this battle inside out. Abu Jahal and Abu Lahab could not believe how the Prophet and how Amir al-Mu'mineen managed to escape to Mecca. They wanted to kill the Prophet, they found Ali in his bed. They wanted to kill Ali, they found Ali had reached Qiba. When they heard this for the first couple of years that the Holy Prophet was in Medina, they tried to make as many onslaughts and as many attacks as is possible on that particular land. Abu Lahab would not rest. How is it that one nephew of mine is now the elder statesman in Medina and the other nephew of mine 
is given such a high position. Whereas I sit here in Mecca without the aristocracy that I used to have. You see, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan, Hind's father Utba, Walid ibn al mughira al As ibn Wa'il. These were the aristocrats of Arabian society. These were aristocrats whose thrones had never been shaken. When Rasulullah got to Medina, now he's become the prime minister or the president of Medina. They looked at themselves and they were in disbelief. How is it that Muhammad is able to now leave Medina? And how is it that the people have welcomed him? Do you know what Abu Jahl would do for the first two years that Rasulullah was in Medina? Every few months, Abu Jahl would send a group of savages, a group of thieves, to attack the gardens and the crops of the new Muslims in Medina. He'd do that. Why? When a new movement happens in a country, the best thing to do to that movement is keep throwing stones on their windows. Why? The more stones that you throw, the less that country can settle. Correct or no? If you look at certain Middle Eastern countries in the world today, the more they pelted stones on their windows, the less that country could develop. Until 11 years after the downfall of a dictator, that country still cannot find any avenues to develop. Likewise, Abu Jahl, what would he do? He'd send these thieves, these savages, to attack the new Muslims in Medina. When he'd send them to attack the new Muslims in Medina, you'd find that Rasulullah, the Muslims would ask him, should we attack Abu Lahab for what he's done? He'd say, no, remain calm. Abu Lahab attacks us with ignorance. We reply back with what? With patience. They kept on attacking to try and dismantle, to try and dis uh, disenchant, to try and make the new Muslims in Medina have problems with one another. And their main problems with Rasulullah were three. What were the problems? The first problem was there was a shake-up to their economic system. Before, Mecca was the financial district of the Arabian world. Now it had competition, Medina. Before, the whole tourism industry would be Mecca. Now there was competition, Medina. Before, the whole world wanted to come and visit the idols of Mecca. Now there is a lack of tickets being bought to come to Mecca from Medina. When an economic industry is shaken, everybody forgets their principles, correct or no? The people, the main thing they want to see is that the stomach is full. The Meccans at the beginning were wondering, before Mecca was the capital of this society. Now Muhammad is endangering our economic interests. Now Medina suddenly is mentioned alongside Mecca. So the first thing that angered them was what? Was that their economic policy was in danger. Because you know what used to happen? You come on holiday to Mecca. These innocent poor people who would come from Yemen or Syria would spend all their life savings to come to Mecca. Yes? When they come, they'd be bowing before the idol for a week, for two weeks. You're obviously spending money to lodge at someone's house, aren't you? You're staying at a hotel somewhere. Eventually, the money runs out. When the money runs out, what happens? You have to go to a loan shark. Who's Mr. Loan Shark? Abu Sufyan, yes? So when you go to the loan shark, the loan shark looks at you and says, have you run out of money? He said, yes. He says, you want some? He said, yes. He said, okay, very well. I'll give you this much. Every day you pay late, you have to give me this much back. By the end, the interest was killing every tourist, correct or no? Now that Medina was a powerhouse, the first thing they wanted to attack Medina for was to bring the economic policy back to Mecca. That's number one. Number two, the idols now were not being respected anymore. And when the idols aren't respected, this isn't increasing. Because now you have a community in Medina which is saying there is no such thing as idols. And a community in Mecca which keeps carving idols. So that was disturbing them. But number three, there was a third thing that disturbs them and disturbs any parents. What is it? Their sons had joined the new Muslim community. It was angering them. You see, when I'm a father, I brought up my son. And I've told him that that Hubal or Allat or Uzza or Manat, I've told them these are all the idols that we worship. My son, and I am Abu Sufyan. My son goes and joins who? My daughter, Um Habiba goes and joins Muhammad. My son, I am Utbah bin Rabi'ah. My son, Hanbala, goes and joins Muhammad. There was a number of the aristocrats whose sons had become Muslims. They could not take the fact Muhammad not only changes the status quo, but now our sons are inspired by his Risala. Our sons are inspired by his message. So they decided, you know what? How dare he change our sons? Our sons today that believe that the black and the white are equal. And they believe that the man and the woman are equal. 
and they believe there's a day of judgment where we'll be punished, let us attack Muhammad at any opportunity. And you know what the opportunity when it came? Abu Sufyan in the summer used to go to Syria. In the winter, he'd go to Yemen. When he goes to Yemen, he used to buy two things from Yemen. He'd either buy leather goods or he'd buy the halwa. Yes, the Yemenis were known for their halwa and the perfumes. He'd come back in the winter from Yemen. In the summer, Abu Sufyan would go to Syria. The Quran mentions, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, li'ilafi Quraysh, ilafihim rihlat al-shita'i wa sayf. The Quraysh in the summer and the winter, winter to Yemen, summer to Syria, Abu Sufyan would go to Syria. Do you know why he was going to Syria? To try and get as much artillery as possible to form an attack on the Prophet Muhammad. He had 50,000 gold pieces worth of trade of Abu Jahl, of Abu Lahab, of Utbah bin Rabi'ah. The caravan was coming back. Adi bin Hatam al Ta'i told Rasulullah, one narration mentions Talha. They said, Ya Rasulullah, Abu Sufyan is returning by Medina. He has got so many goods and the weapons are ready to attack us. Rasulullah told them, Go and check. When Abu Sufyan heard they were coming to check, Abu Sufyan had a servant of his. He said to his servant, listen to me, come here. He said, what is it? He said, you take this camel, you head towards Mecca. You go there. You meet Abu Jahl. You meet Abu Lahab. What I want you to do just before you get to Mecca is I want you to stab the camel at an angle that the camel doesn't die. And I want you to show that your shirt is ripped and there's blood all over it. Enter Mecca and say to them that all of the goods have been seized by Muhammad. No Arab likes to lose money, correct or no? When these guys are sitting in Mecca waiting on this long journey from Syria, they're waiting on this long journey for their goods. That person, Abu Sufyan knew one thing. You cause Chinese whispers in a community, you can destroy and you can make up any rumor as well, correct? The caravan hadn't been seized. Abu Sufyan, as soon as he heard that Rasulullah and his companions were about to seize the caravan, he took the Red Sea path towards Mecca, the longer path. He made sure the caravans were seized. But let's spread a rumor that the caravan's been stolen and seized by Muhammad. Yes? When the news reached Abu Lahab, Abu Lahab was sitting, Abu Jahl was sitting. Utbah bin Rabi'ah, Hind, wife of Abu Sufyan, her father was sitting. What's going on? Why is your shirt full of blood? Like the Qamis of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. Yes? Why is your shirt full of blood? Why is the camel being stabbed? They turned around to him and they said, he turned around to them and he said, Muhammad has seized all of our goods. He's seized and stolen everything and he's attacked me. Look at what this man's doing. Abu Jahl turned around to all of them. He said, you see that Muhammad, not only does he change our sons and makes them Muslim, not only has he changed the economic industry for us, now he takes all of our goods. I declare from now that we go to Medina. I dedicate and donate 700 camels, 100 horses. Do you know how much money that is at that time? 100 horses and 700 camels. He said, I'll donate as much as you want. Abu Lahab, what do you donate? He said, I'll donate whatever weapons you want. Utbah. Utbah was hesitant. Why? His son, Hind's brother, had become Muslim. Hind had three brothers. Yes? Of them, Walid had been with his father all the time. But Hamdala had joined Rasulullah. Subhanallah. In some families you can have good. And in some families you can have absolute dirt. So, he had joined Rasulullah. When he had joined Rasulullah, Utbah was a bit uncertain. Abu Jahl said, Utbah, do not worry. We will go and fight. He said, but you know what? Muhammad may not have seized. You never know. He said, what? You now, because your son's with Muhammad, your heart goes soft. Because you know there's going to be a war and you're going to have to kill your son. He said to him, you think that the heart of Utbah and Rabia goes soft? Let's go out and fight. I'm ready. All of them gathered. Rasulullah asked Ali ibn Abi Talib in Medina. He said to him, Ali, Go towards the area where the caravan had gone. Go and see if you spot anything fishy in the area. Imam Ali ibn Talib went there. He saw two people by the watering wells of Badr. He looked at them and they began talking to each other. And one said to the other, you know what? There's going to be a big war over here. Look how many are coming over from Mecca. Imam Ali looked at them. He said, what do you mean there's going to be a big war? They saw Ali ibn Talib. Both of them went silent. They said, no, no, there's nothing. He said, tell me. What do you mean there's going to be a big war? What, is your, what are your words? They said to him that don't you know that the Meccans are coming with an army of 950, 700 camels, 100 horses. They're coming to attack Medina. 
and they're coming towards this area. Ali ibn Abi Talib went back to Rasulullah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, let me make clear something to you. They're coming to attack. At the head of them is Abu Jahl and their Utbah bin Rabi'ah and they're coming to attack us. Rasulullah said, very well, then all of us are going to have to be ready. He turned around towards his companions. This is a delicate point which I think is of the utmost importance. It's one thing to believe in a prophet. It's one thing to believe in an imam. But your readiness to lay down your life for them could be the ultimate test. Yes? There are many of us in this world. We serve Ahl al-Bayt. We try and dedicate our lives to Ahl al-Bayt. When Sham happened, none of us were willing to pack our bags and go and defend Bibi Zainab. Let's be clear about this. And if Iraq happens now and there's an announcement made, I don't think there's many of us who are really that ready to pack the bags and go. Yes! We'll turn around and we'll say, we'll die for them. Ya laytana kunna. Ma'akum, every day in Ziyara, we wish we were with you. But there's a test here. It's a huge test. What I'm about to narrate about Badr is not something that should be taken with a pinch of salt. Why? Because what I'm about to narrate, there'll be some people turn around and say, <laughs> typical, only Ali ibn Abi Talib is brave, the rest aren't. Habibi, don't say the rest aren't. You might have been one of the rest if you were there. Because there are some who talk and talk and talk about their dedication to Ahlul Bayt. The moment we have to leave the dunya, the moment we have to leave our possessions, each one of us can become a this or a that. Correct or no? Because over the next few nights, when we look at the battles in Medina, when people run away from battles, when people are scared to come to battles, don't turn around and tell me, subhanallah, look at them, they all ran away. Habibi, you might not even have turned up. Forget run away. Yes? The test is what? The test could be a day. Like those 72 at Karbala turned up. Everybody else could have. They could have. They loved Allah and they loved this Prophet. But it's a litmus test of Iman. Those who are willing to lay down and sell their soul for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah turned around. It was a small Muslim community. When he turned around, he said to them, first he asked them, are you ready to fight or no? The first group who came forward, Abu Bakr came forward. He said, oh Muhammad, know that the Quraysh are a haughty group of people and they have some of the greatest warriors, skilled swordsmen. How are we going to defeat them? Umar ibn al-Khattab reiterated the same. He said that these are men who are experienced in their wars. There's no way that we can defeat them. Miqdad stood up. He looked at Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, you've commanded us and we obey your commands. And you've ordered us and we obey your orders. Ya Rasulullah, we will not say to you what the children of Israel said to Moses. Go you and your Lord. Ya Rasulullah, you obey us and we will, you order us and we will obey you and we'll be with you the whole journey. That's why whenever Rasulullah would say, Allah ordered me to love four, Salman, Abu Dhar, Miqdad and Ammar. That's one of the reasons. That moment of dedication where he said, you know what? What are you two talking about? You're worried? We're alongside Rasulullah. How could we worry in a battlefield? From the Muhajirun, 80 of them stood up. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we are with you. The Ansar, the people of Medina, they never had to fight with Rasulullah. All they said is, Ya Rasulullah, come to Medina. We'll defend you. But they don't have to fight with him. But Sa'ad stood up. What did he say? He said, Ya Rasulullah, if it means I have to dip myself in the oceans of the seas and in order that I defend you, Ya Rasulullah, I'll sacrifice my life for you. They came together, 233 from them, 80 from the Muhajirun. Total how many? 313. Those 313 came together. Abu Jahal was leaving Mecca. Two notable people didn't come with him to war, weren't going to come with him to war. The first of them was whom? Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab didn't attend Badr, by the way, yes? Subhanallah, God's the greatest planners. I'll show you why it's good he didn't attend. Abu Lahab didn't attend. You know why? Abu Lahab hired someone to attend on his behalf. That's phenomenal. Imagine you hire someone. You're like, excuse me, go and fight in the battle. When you come back, I'll give you 4,000 dinar. That's a proper businessman because he knows his nephew on the other side of that battle is going to finish this guy off. Yes? So Abu Lahab goes to Al-As bin Hashim. He says to him, listen Al-As, 4,000 when you return. Habibi, give me the money now. He said, no, oh, come back from better, I'll give you. <laughs> Phenomenal businessman. Yes? You go, and if you make it back, I'll give you the money. Abu Lahab didn't go. Umayyah, the man who tortured Bilal. You've seen the film, The Message, the man who places the black rock on Bilal's body. Umayyah wasn't intending to turn up for better. Someone came to me and said, listen, why don't you put ladies' eyeliner on? 
I said, what do you mean? I said, you're a lady, it turns out to be. We're going to fight Muhammad, who's changed our society, and you're sitting here saying, I'm not going to go? He said, how dare you call me a woman? I will be ready to go. He stood up, he joined Abu Jahl, joined Utbah, they all got to the battlefield. You know, before they got to the battlefield, the news reached them. Muhammad has not stolen Abu Sufyan's caravan. Abu Sufyan is safe. Utbah bin Rabi'ah turned around to Abu Jahl. He said, listen, then let's go back. Why? Because Utbah's heart is still with his son in Rasulullah's army. Correct? A father remains a father. Yes? You can be a kafir, Muslim. Your father, your son is on the other side. Abu Jahl turned around and said, what do you mean you want to turn around? He said, listen, Abu Sufyan's caravan, our goods are safe. Let's go back. He said, let's use it as an excuse to finish Muhammad once and for all. Who cares if our goods are safe? He said to him, come on. He said, no. He said, it doesn't matter. You want to fight? Fight. Go back. He said, what? You're testing my bravery? He said, it seems your son has affected you. He said, no, I will come. They turned out to the beginning. Rasulullah got to the uh, area of Badr, to the southwest of Medina as Badr. When he got there, as soon as he got there, he sat in a certain area. One of his companions came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, can I ask you, where you've decided to sit, did Allah inspire you or is it your own decision? He said, no, it's my own decision. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I know this area very well. Do you mind if I show you a place which I think is good for us? He said, by all means. If you are an expert in this area, then I'll listen to you. He said, Ya Rasulullah, that's area near the wells. Because one thing we don't want in the middle of a battle in Arabia is for the soldiers to be thirsty. Correct or no? We want the soldiers to be ready near the wells. So he positioned them near the wells, the wells of Badr. And truly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the night of Badr, the blessings he gave the, the Muslims was unbelievable. There's only 313 of them, brothers. 950 of the opposition. There's no way they can win. The Muslims are two horses, 70 camels. The opposition, 700 camels, 100 horses. There's no way you can win. On the night of Badr, Quran mentions, and we let you sleep easily on the night of Badr. Yes? The world of Hadith mentions, they let them sleep easily. You know, on the night of any big performance, of any big stage, you're moving one way and the other. You have a job interview, you have a big meeting, you, you can't rest, you have an exam. Allah says, those who believed in me, I let them rest on the night of Badr. Their sleep was the best sleep they had. Number two, I let rain fall for them so they could purify themselves. But for Abu Jahl, so it doesn't let his horses go up the hills. The horses want to go up the hills, but when there's rain, it affects them on that type of terrain. Correct or no? So Allah made the rain come down. Number three, I made the opposition look small and I made you look big. Allahu Akbar. We're 313, they're 950. But if Allah wants to, He can make 950 look like 313 and 313 look like 950. Yes? And that's an important point when it comes to the 12th of Al Muhammad. Why? Because sometimes people wonder if we Muslims are this many when the 12th Imam returns. No, Allah will instill in your heart, makes you feel like you're the greater force and the opposition is the smaller force. Yes? Therefore, at Badr, they came out. Who came out to speak at the beginning of the battle? The first to come out and speak was Hind. His father, Utbah bin Rabi'ah, he came out. He said, O oh, army of Muhammad, let me present myself to you. I am Utbah, son of Rabi'ah. On one side of me is my son, Walid, Hind's brother. On the other side is my brother, Sheba. Give us three from you who are our equals in war. Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib was on the ground. Yes, Rasulullah was at the back overlooking the army. Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib brought out three soldiers in front of him. He looked at them. He said, name yourselves. They named themselves. He said, listen, this is not our equals. Let Bani Hashim bring their three. I don't want you to give me the riffraff. Give me Bani Hashim. Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib came out. He said, I am Hamza, son of Abdul Muttalib. You know me very well. On one side of me is Ali, son of Abu Talib. On the other side is Ubaidah. Are we your equals? He said, yes, you are my equals. He said, very well. Then let me say one thing to you before we begin. There is no God but God. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. Let us proceed. Utbah, father of Hind, her brother Walid, and the uncle Sheba, all of them were together. 
Walid versus Ali. That was the first combat. Hamza versus Utbah, his father. These names are all important when we get to Uhud, of course. And then Ubaida versus Shay. What happened? Ali ibn Abi Talib and Walid were the two, youngest of the two. Ali ibn Abi Talib had the sword with the two pronged, yes? Known as Tulfiqar, he managed to catch Walid's sword, flicked it in the air. Now he's got both swords, finishes Walid with one strike, finished on the ground. Then Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib killed Utbah bin Rabi'ah, and then Ubaidah, their cousin, got injured by the strike of Shaiba. At that moment, what happened? Ali ibn Abi Talib went and he struck his uncle, having killed her brother, and managed to save Ubaidah, take him to the other side. He died as a shaheed. When those three had fought the three, then Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib looked at Ali ibn Abi Talib and said, are you ready? He said, I'm more than ready. Let me see them all now. Ali ibn Abi Talib, there is a narration mentioned, Sa'ad ibn Abi, Abi Waqa says, we were at the back of the battle just admiring Ali ibn Abi Talib's performance on the battlefield. Yes? 70 killed from the opposition, 35 from the sword of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Absolute annihilation from him. It was impossible to come near him. One day, a person from Bani Kanana, he comes, Imam Shafi narrates this, he says, a person comes to Muawiyah, says, were you there in the battle of Badr? He said, yes, I was there. He said, did you fight? He said, no, I was in the back rows, I didn't fight. He said, how was Ali ibn Abi Talib on the day of Badr? He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib fought like he had eyes on the back of his head. Yes? He said, even from behind him, he's striking you. From the front, he's striking you. At the same time, he strikes two people that's there in front and behind. Absolute annihilation of the opposition on that day of Badr. And there were some notable people who had to be killed. Yes? Imagine all those 13 years, what Rasulullah and Imam Ali went through in the Sha'b of Abu Talib for three years, what Abu Lahab did to them in those years, what Abu Lahab did to Rasulullah, what the aims of killing, now they were in the ascendancy. The first they wanted to finish up was who? Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was on the opposition, Abu Jahl used to be the man, gets the feces of a camel, puts it on Rasulullah's head in sujood, yes? Rasulullah would be in sujood, he gets the whole feces of the camel, puts it all on the head of Rasulullah, the Quran would say have you seen the one who affects our servant when he's in his prayer Abu Jahl was in the middle of the battle there was a companion of Rasulullah famous companion you all know Abdullah bin Mas'ud correct Abdullah bin Mas'ud was like four foot six really short yes so at the beginning of battle Badr he said to Rasulullah he said yeah, yeah Rasulullah listen Ali ibn Abi Talib and Hamza these guys they're at the front of the battlefield people like me are short we can't hurt anyone what shall we do, Ya Rasulullah? He said, if you see any of the opposition in their last moments, finish them from the leaders. Abu Jahl had been struck. He fell on the ground. He was in his final moments. Abdullah bin Mas'ud came, mounted himself on Abu Jahl and struck him. Now listen to what Rasulullah said in the hadith. Rasulullah said, Abu Jahl is more arrogant than Fir'aun. I don't understand. How? Fir'aun said, I am God, correct? So how is Abu Jahl more arrogant? When Abdullah bin Mas'ud sat on Abu Jahl's chest, you know what Abu Jahl looked at him and said? I beg you don't kill me. I don't want to be remembered for someone short killing me. Pharaoh, when he was dying, when he was drowning, he said, now I believe, correct? At least he said, I believe in the Lord of Musa. Abu Jahl is more concerned with the height of his killer. Pharaoh at the end says, I believe. But what's the point? You're drowning, all of us will believe. But Abu Jahl says, get someone taller than you, please. I want to be written down that someone seven foot one killed me, not four foot six. Someone like that, if you let him live for thousands of years, will remain arrogant. There's no change. There's no change. Then who else was caught? Umayyah bin Khalaf, the one who used to torture Bilal, Bilal saw him from a distance. You know what this man used to do to Bilal? The hot rock, black rock of Arabia. He'd lay Bilal naked on the ground in Arabia and put the black rock on him and say to him, Who's your Lord, Allah or Allah and Uzza? And Bilal, while the rock is on top, would say, Ahad, Ahad, Ahad. There is only one God, one God. He'd torture him, he'd make the kids pelt him with rocks while he's chained. Bilal saw Umayyah in the battle of Badr. Bilal went towards him. Umayyah said, this is phenomenal. Umayyah calls out, is there any of the Arabs who used to be my friends who can offer me sanctuary? Abdul Rahman bin Awf was a Muslim on that day, yes? But he was good friends with 
Umayyah. He said, don't worry, come with me, I'll offer you sanctuary. This is the people you have fighting. You have one class of people serving Allah. Another, you don't know if he's joined the religion because of this, or he's joined the religion because he really believes in the religion. Yes? He said to Umayyah, don't worry. Bilal said, what do you mean don't worry? The man used to torture me when I was in Mecca. They caught him. They killed him. And they had the most unanimous victory. Allah in the Quran said, I send them angels to help them. Yes? 313 against 950. And I tell you, Ali ibn Abi Talib's performance on that day. And there's many a performance which we're going to come to in these days, inshallah. But that performance on that day, in his early 20s, a mesmerizing performance. And that performance made Umar bin Abdul Aziz stop the la'na on Ali in, in the time of Bani Umayyah. Umar bin Abdul Aziz says, we were kids. We would curse Ali ibn Abi Talib as the best thing we could do. He said, one day, my Quran teacher, my Quran teacher was sitting in front of me. I cursed Ali ibn Abi Talib. He frowned at me. I looked at him. I said, I'm the son of a king. I'm a Khalifa, Bani Umayyah, kid. My father is Caliph. How dare you frown at me? He said, my son, haven't we studied the Quran? He said, yes. He said, didn't we study the ayah in the Quran about the battle of Badr? Allah gave you victory in Badr. You were such a weak number. He said, yes. He said, what do you think of those who fought at Badr? He said, they must be great people. What if a man fought on that day and killed half the opposition on behalf of the religion of Islam? He said, that man must have been a great man. He said, the man Bani Umayyah curses on their pulpits is the man of the day of Badr. Yes? Umar bin Abdul Aziz was six at the time. You know what he said? He said, one day when I become Khalifa, I'll stop the la'na on Ali ibn Abi Talib on the pulpits. He became Khalifa in his early 30s. He stopped the la'na. They killed him two years later because he stopped the la'na on Ali. It went to show you Ali ibn Abi Talib's performance at Badr meant that the la'na later on would be stopped because people were wondering, we're giving la'na on a young man whose dedication on the day of Badr. He was willing to sacrifice his life in the most powerful of performances. And that's why, you know, in Nahj al when Imam fights Muawiyah al Safin, Imam looks towards Muawiyah's army and says, Muawiyah, why don't you come out and fight me one on one? So I do to you what I did to your grandfather on the day of Badr. Yes? The same way, because who's his grandfather? Hin's dad, Hin's brother, correct? These are all his uncles. So he says to him, fight me one-on-one. -on -one. So I do to you what I did to them. The way I finished them when I was a young man, I'll finish you as well. Yes? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib on that day in Badr was in a different league to any soldier. He highlighted the strength and the bravery and perseverance that he had. When the Badr battle finished, what happened? The first thing that happened was Rasulullah for the first time distributed the spoils of a war. Subhanallah, listen to what happens. Who is the greatest performer on the day of Badr? Who did I just mention had the best performance? Which, which man? Imam Ali. Rasulullah started distributing the spoils of war. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas comes to him. He says to him, I'm from Bani Zuhra. You give me the same spoils of war as that water carrier. He comes to the Prophet. He says, this, me and him, he carries water, this companion, all he did at Badr, and it's not a, a small thing, to carry water is a big thing. At the end there, you're still serving, correct or no? He said, that water carrier, you give him the same spoils as me. He looked at him, he said, Sa'ad, in this religion, we've come not to make differentiation between people. Anyone who comes on this jihad and they are serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they deserve the same spoils of war. Ali ibn Abi Talib has just finished half the opposition. He gets the same as everybody else. There's no distinction. Everybody gets the same. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas says, I'm from Bani Zuhra. Allah on Umar bin Sa'ad. I don't understand some of these people. One minute they're rude to Rasulullah, the next minute their sons kill the grandson of Rasulullah, and at the end of the day they all. So he said, I don't want. So Rasulullah made it clear. The first battle, don't all of you come and tell me we are from Bani Fulan and Bani Fulan. You come on this jihad, all of you are equal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I share the spoils of war. I make it clear that nobody's above Allah. Don't come and tell me I'm Bani Suhra, I'm Bani Najjar, even Bani Hashim. Same. Everybody, there is an entitlement. Allah accords the entitlement as to the Quran. That's number one. Number two, what happened? Rasulullah, what did he do? Rasulullah, the second thing he did, there were certain of the prisoners who were caught. Rasulullah said, don't punish them. Why? 
He said they've been compelled to come to Badr. They didn't want to come. They were forced to attend. Like who? The first of them, his uncle Abbas. Yes? Abbas was on the side of Abu Jahl and Badr, not on the side of Rasulullah. He was compelled by the Meccans to join. Rasulullah said, my uncle was compelled. Let him go. Likewise, the economic minister of Mecca in the Quraysh, with, works with Abu Lahab and all of them. Rasulullah said, let him go. He said, Ya Rasulullah, is the economic minister of the Quraysh. He said, he's economic minister, but has never harmed us in any way. He's never ever spoken out against me. He's never ruled against the religion of Islam. He used to do his job and he used to go home towards whom? He used to go home towards his family. Rasulullah said, let him go. Then there was another group of prisoners because people portray Rasulullah as a barbaric man who used to kill everybody. These prisoners, they came to him. There was 50 prisoners. They came and said, Ya Rasulullah, what shall we do with these 50 prisoners? We've called them from the army of Abu Jahl. Umar ibn al-Khattab stood up. He said, Ya Rasulullah, let's kill them. He said, no, no. Abu Bakr stood up. He said, Ya Rasulullah, let us, for example, uh, seize them for this period. He said, no, let go of that. He said, we'll ransom them. He said, ransom them how? He said, whoever of the prisoners of better teaches our people to read and write, release them. Education, yes? I want my companions to be educated. If those companions of Abu Jahl can read and write, if they teach my companions, ransom them. Ransom them? They've come to fight us. He said, doesn't matter. If they can read and write, if they teach us to read and write, they teach these companions, the moment they teach us how to read and write, let them be released. This is a man who wants to kill everyone in his opposition. As said, normally if you capture prisoners from the opposition, you want to execute them straight away. He said, let them teach us to read and write. If they teach us how to read and write, then from there, we will be able to let them. As soon as they taught a few companions how to read and write, they were told, please go back to your families. You are now released. Yes? The man had honor and dignity. In the aftermath of such a battle, these people would come to fight him. Fight him. All they had to do was teach the people how to read and write. And they were then released. And that's why that battle became a phenomenal battle. Even Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib would never forget that battle. Later on, one day, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is sitting with his companion, Al Asbaq bin Nubata. He says to him, Oh, Al Asbaq, when Al Asbaq asks him, How many will be the companions of the Mahdi? Yes? He replies to him, The same number that were in Badr will be with the Mahdi. 313 with, were at Badr, 313 were with the Mahdi. Then he said, they will come from the east and they will come from the west. Subhanallah. And that time we, know, we knew what the east was. We didn't really know what the west was, correct? Columbus still hadn't sent us any emails at the time, yes? At the time we weren't sure. Maybe we knew about Spain just about and so on. Subhanallah today, it seems a lot of the soldiers of the Mahdi are truly rising from the western world, yes? A lot of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, a lot of the servants of Ahlul Bayt in the western world are holding up the message of the Mahdi right now. Imam said, the number of the soldiers of the Mahdi will be the same as the number of the soldiers on the day of Badr. Then he said, they will never defame each other. They'll never abuse each other. They'll never backbite each other. They'll never slander each other. They'll protect each other's rights and honor each other. That's the companions of the Mahdi. Therefore, you found that Imam made it clear. The battle of Badr, those 313 who helped the first man, will be the 313 who will be the last man, yes? And without a doubt, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are amongst those 313, correct or no? That we are amongst those generals the same way the first battle of Islam, we were, how many the Quran says, وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَأَنْتُمْ Allah helped you and you were weak. Ya Allah, in our state of weakness, help the followers of Muhammad and Al Muhammad, yes? That there may be only a few of us, but in the same way Allah sent the Malaika, the angels, to help those soldiers, surely Allah will send Malaika to help us as well. Therefore, who used it? Imam Ali ibn Talib used it. But the next man to use it was whom? The next man to use it was Yazid bin Muawiyah and his court in front of the followers of Ahlul Bayt In which way? Yazid used it in a devastating way. He could see the daughter of Ali standing in front of him and Ali's grandchildren in front of them. And he knew that what's the best strike I should strike? Let me use better to see who really won today. Yes. He looked towards them and he recited the lines of poetry. Yazid, 
لعبت هاشم بالملك فلا خبر جاء ولا وحي نزل. He said, I wish my ancestors were present at Badr so they could see what I've done today. Hashim played with the kingdom. There was no belief and there was no revelation. You know why he said that? The first reason he said that was his grandfather, his mom Hind. And his grandfather was killed where? His grandfather was killed at Badr, his ancestor. So he wanted to make clear that now look, where is Ali to see the way I've treated Zainab today? Yes, I can whip her from Kufa to Sham and he can't do nothing about it. I can get Ruqayya slapped and beaten and he can't do nothing about it. I can have Layla and Rabab chained through the bazaar of Sham and he cannot be here to do anything about it. You know, the chains had cut them so much wise. Some women were taller than the others. Ruqayya had to tiptoe because the chains were cutting her neck. Yes? Sukaina had to tiptoe because Layla was taller than her. So it was cutting her neck when she was walking. He wanted them humiliated because of revenge for what Ali had done at Badr. In Dua Nudba we say that the haqid of Badr remained with certain people. The hatred of Badr remained. It remained with Muawiyah and the sons of Muawiyah. And Yazid wanted the humiliation to occur. And you know how he wanted it to occur. First, he made Sham the land of Eid. Yes, people who are on the street celebrating. Yes, this was a yom. Tabarakat bihi al Umayyah. It was a yom. It was barakah for Bani Umayyah. They'd give out sweets to the children because there are a group of rebels who are being attacked. And secondly, he'd want everybody to come out into the palace so they would see clearly Zainab without the hijab she used to wear with her father. So they'd see Kulthum with Without the hijab she used to wear with her father. He wanted them embarrassed in front of everyone, yes? The Zainab who nobody had laid eyes upon was now full of eyes gazing upon her, yes? And that's why the narrations mentioned that he called his courtier. He said, bring me my wife Hind. I want Hind next to me now. When they went to call Hind, Hind originally used to serve in the house of Imam Ali. And then she served in the house of Imam al Hassan. When Muawiyah saw Imam Hassan die, he took Hind, he made her marry Yazid. She now had lived in Sham for many years. The years she used to live in Medina were no longer with her. She now lived where? She now lived in Sham. Her servant came to her. She said, oh Hind, we need something from you. She said, what is it? He said, Yazid has a group of rebels who have come. Yes, a group of rebels have come. Yazid wants you to come and sit on the throne next to him so he can make fun and humiliate these rebels. Rebels. She said, very well, I will get changed. She got changed. She got ready. She got up. She went and sat by the throne. Zainab and Kulthum were on the ground while Hind sat on the throne. Zainab looked at Kulthum. She said to her, Kulthum, do you recognize her? Uh, Kulthum said, no, I don't. Who is she? She said, do you remember when we were younger, Hind used to serve in our house uh, in Medina? She said, yes. Yeah. She said, that's Hind sitting over there. But brothers, I want to ask you one question and sisters. How old did Bibi Zainab look that he didn't recognize Zainab? Yes, Zainab was on the ground. And that moment, Hind saw Zainab and Kulthum whispering to one another. Hind looked at them. She said, excuse me, I don't know you two. I don't know your names. Can I ask you one question? They said, yes. She said, excuse me, where are you from? And they said, we are from the land of Medina. As soon as she had the land of Medina, she got off her throne and she said, on the ground next to them. She sat on the ground next to them. When she sat there, Sayyidah Zainab asked her, why do you sit next to us here on the ground? She said to them, out of respect for the people of Medina, when I was younger, I used to serve a house in Medina. She looked at them and she said, may I ask you, do you know about the house? Sayyidah Zainab said, whose house did you serve in? She said, I used to serve in the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib when I was younger. Do you know any members of the house anymore? I ask you, what age was Zainab? Why didn't she recognize her? What had Karbala done to Zainab? What had Kufa done to Zainab? What have they done today to Zainab in Sham? Yes. 
She said to her, do you know the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib? She said to her, yes, I know that house. She said to her, may I ask you about some of the members of that house? Allahu Akbar, who's she going to ask about? Sayyidah Zainab said to her, go ahead, ask me. She said, may I ask you about Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas? Where is he now? Sayyidah Zainab looked towards her. She said to her, do you see the head on that spear? She said to her, yes. She said, that is Abbas on the spear over there. And then she said to her, may I ask you about Hussein? Where is Abba Abdullah now? I want to see him. She said to her, do you see the head on that spear? She said to her, yes. She said, that is the head of Abba Abdullah. But the next line breaks the heart of every lover of Al Muhammad. She said to her, may I ask you, where where is Kulthum and where is Zainab al Hashemiya? She said to us for Kulthum, she is over there. But as for Zainab al Hashemiya, I don't know where Zainab al Hashemiya is. All I know is Zainab al Masbiya, Zainab the prisoner of Shab. Here I am. When Hind heard this, she ran into the court of Yazid. Her hijab fell from her hair. Yazid looked at her and said, how dare you run in here without your hijab? She looked at him and she said to him, Yazid, you tell me about my hijab. How about the hijab of the daughters of Fatima al Zahra? What do you do? We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Ya Allah, allow us to be amongst the 313 companions of Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Bless us in the way you blessed the 313 on the day of Badr. Ya Allah, allow us to be amongst those who follow the path of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Raise us with Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Allow us to be amongst those who receive his wasila in this world and his shafa'a in the hereafter. Unite the Ummah of Muhammad and Al Muhammad and allow them to unite under the banner of Muhammad and Al-Muhammad. Our brothers in Iraq bring peace and prosperity to them. Our brothers in Sham bring peace and prosperity to them. Our brothers in Pakistan and Afghanistan and India and in Bahrain bring peace and prosperity to them. Ya Allah, bring peace in the land of Lebanon and the land of Iran. Remove all the oppression that exists in all Muslim lands and allow us to be amongst those who follow the message of Muhammad and Al-Muhammad. We pray for our dear brother once again. Brother Shaini Jafar in Allentown, we need all of the du'as of the community together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-Muthara idha da'a wa yakshifu al-Sur. 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 أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُفْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ Ya Allah, in the name of the one who was ill at Karbala, Imam Zayn al-Abideen. Ya Allah, cure our loved ones. Ya Allah, give strength to all of our followers who are in times of difficulty and hardship at this moment. We'd like to also welcome Dr. Abidi who has come from the United States of America. He is the president of the Shia communities in America. Inshallah, we welcome him here in the Nairobi Jamaat alongside Dr. Azamat Hussain. Both of them have come as representatives from America uh, to inform us about the situation of the followers of Ahlul Bayt in America. Inshallah, the community welcomes them and we are all able to benefit from them over the next couple of days, Inshallah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Surah Al-Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat.